Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If the Lord had not been on our side, this is Israel's song. If the Lord had not been on our side, when men rose against us, then would they have swallowed us alive when their anger was kindled. Then would the waters have engulfed us, the torrent gone over us. Over our heads would have swept the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who did not give us a prey to their teeth. Our life like a bird has escaped from the snare of the fowler. Indeed, the snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, we gather together in your name. We come as living sacrifices to offer you our worship and thanksgiving, our praise and our prayers. Come among us, living Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our hearts and minds so that we may recognise your presence, hear your voice, know your will and walk in your way. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Wipe away.
would we be without God? Have you ever contemplated that question? I mean, most of us can make a statement like, um, if it wasn't for so-and-so, I wouldn't be a Christian. Or if it wasn't for so-and-so, I wouldn't be at this place in my life. Maybe you might say, if, if it weren't for mum and dad, you know, I wouldn't be the person I am. But do we, do, do we, do we spend as much time thinking about where we would be without our Heavenly Father? Without the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus Christ? Or without the gift of God's Holy Spirit in our lives? Do we truly recognise just how much our Heavenly Father has done for us and continues to do for us each and every minute of every day? I have to say, I tend to take his goodness for granted. I pray about, you know, something in my life and, and he answers and then I forget to thank him. Or he answers and it wasn't quite what I wanted. And so I'm not happy. And yet I forget that every day I wake from my night's sleep only by his grace that I can walk this earth for another 24 hours only because of his mercy. When I do take time to sit down and really think about that question, where would I be without God? I'm overcome with what my life could have become without his presence in it. Even with his presence, I still made a monumental stuff up of it. How much worse would it have been had he not been there, nudging me in the background, protecting me, guiding me, and offering his steadfast love and faithfulness? Let God be praised in your life. Put yourself in that psalm this week and pray the words of praise back to God thanking him for all that he's done and acknowledge where you would be without him let's pray loving heavenly father where we haven't always acknowledged you and all that you've done for us or been grateful and remembered to thank you or even recognised just how hard you have fought for us. Forgive us. We confess that we can be prone to get swallowed up by our needs and selfishness and chasing after things that don't save us. There's times we've been swept away by the floods of our own making and we've been guilty of attacking one another instead of seeking peace. But even though we often fall short, we know that you have always been on our side and have not let us become overwhelmed and swept away in the raging waters of this life. Our help is from you, Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. And we thank you and praise you for your forgiveness, your goodness, your mercy, and your everlasting peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the Lord is on your side, offering his 
words of forgiveness, protecting you from danger. We are a, a forgiven people, bound together in God's love. We are the body of Christ, forgiven and free. And know your sins are forgiven and walk in that freedom. And go in the peace of Jesus to love and to serve the Lord and each other. Amen. On the way into church this morning, one of you gave me this little piece of paper which, is, which has got words on it that's been on your fridge for a long time. I really do like this. Indulgence says, drink your way out. Philosophy says, think your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Industry says, work your way out. Communism says, strike your way out. Fascism says, bluff your way out. Militarism says, fight your way out. But Christ says, I am the way out. I'm 
I really like that. That's not the text for the day, but <laughs> but it's not bad. The um, this is, as you know, a series of sermons based on Philippians, and it's so Philippians is a letter that Paul wrote from jail when he's older. He's certainly much wiser. He's had many years to think about the things that are critical and. Um, Philippians with Ephesians and Colossians. You can see that Paul is, is sitting in that jail and he is reflecting and he is contemplating and he is drawing together, if you like, so many of the things that he has seen. As you know, Paul was all his life preoccupied with God. We would look back now at Paul before he hit the road to Damascus and we'd say he was aggressive, he was almost angry, there was a lot of accusation in what he was doing, there was a lot of fight in what he was doing. A fanatic. He was a fanatic. We wouldn't make much distinction now between the Paul who was so aggressive in that direction and so much of the aggression that you see in some faiths now. You wouldn't actually make much distinction between what Paul represented and the Inquisition. We will fight for our faith and we will establish it with, with at the edge of a sword almost. We will defend it. And then, of course, he had his meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And something completely changed in Paul. And it wasn't that he was any less passionate, but now it was, it was something that was completely wrapped and overwhelmed with holy love. Now it created something in him that had a passionate longing and affection for the people that he was meeting and for the people who did not, yet, did not yet know the gospel. Paul was steeped, absolutely steeped in everything from Genesis to Malachi. He probably knew it, if, if you can say this, he probably knew it as well as Jesus knew it in terms of Jesus getting his knowledge from reading it, knowing it, listening on the Sabbath, all of that stuff. Paul knew it. After the, after the road to Damascus, he says this. This is how he sums it up at the, at the end of his life. What have I been doing? My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is Paul who knew everything that he needed to know about God before the Damascus Road. And he comes back to it afterwards at the end of his life and he says, my purpose is they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, we, this, is, this whole series is called Gems from Jail. And obviously Paul's number one great diamond gem is Jesus Christ. He cannot speak of God anymore after that Damascus Road experience without speaking about Jesus Christ. For him, if you read his, any of his writings, every sentence somewhere will have a reference to Jesus Christ, somehow. This is his wonderment, this is his astonishment, this is his joy. And it's something that he knew that he shared with that Philippian congregation. He knew that he shared it with the Philippian congregation. So he talks about it in, in the Philippians text. And he says this, in Philippians 1, chapter 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. And his next verse, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. 
because of that partnership you have with me in the gospel. And it's in that context that you get that verse which we, we love to quote, and I think we quote it in hope for our children in particular, when he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Don't we pray that for our kids? And Paul is expressing it as a confidence even here. And he talks then about God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He can't think of a single adverb or adjective that isn't connected with Christ. He doesn't just say, I have affection for you. It's the affection of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to verse 9, which is the focus for today's address. And this is my prayer. I pray for you all the time. I pray with joy. I pray with thanksgiving. This is my prayer. Verse 9, that your love may abound more and more. You would expect him to pray that. True? You would expect him to pray it. But what is intriguing, and this is the gem for the day, it's a gem in a prayer. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That your, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge, of, in, in, in knowledge and depth of insight. And he goes on to say, so that you may be able to discern what's best, that you can be pure and blameless till the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. But Paul makes a connection between knowledge, understanding and insight and abounding love. And the insight, he always connects and ties to what is being revealed in the great treasure of Jesus Christ. So he operates with a conviction. He's not saying, I command you and I tell you that you should love more. Simply saying, as you, as you comprehend and understand and absorb and are absorbed by the insight and the knowledge and the understanding of who Jesus Christ is, your love begins to abound. It grows. It's something that cannot be contained. Those of you who are steeped a little bit in the Old Testament or who know your Old Testament, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and that's wisdom is a whole part of this, Christ, the wisdom of God, the power of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And Paul understood that knowledge of the Holy One in the Old Testament is about knowledge of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And as people get to understand that somehow or other this this Jesus Christ person who reveals who, who is the treasure of God and who reveals the treasure of God, as you know him, you know the Father. This is his conviction. And as you know him and you know the Father, then there's more and more of the experience of the life of Jesus Christ. And for him, that's why I love this thing, Christ is the only way out. For Paul... The only way to know what God is like is in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus speaks to the Jews in John chapter 6, in which we mentioned earlier in the, in the service, when Jesus speaks to the Jews and they say, what must we do to do the works of God? Paul, uh, Jesus turns around and says, this is the work of God that you believe in the one the Father sent. And it's not a static answer that you learn in confirmation or that you learned in Sunday school. And you did learn it in Sunday school. Most of us did. But it's a living relationship. It's a living, it's a living truth that is lived out every single day. Some point in your life and my life, you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust there. But day by day, in your struggles with your husbands or your wives, in your struggles with your kids, in your workplace... We are confronted, are we not, with how will I live in trust of the truth of Jesus Christ in this place? And it's a trust thing, but it's also a love thing. 
because we carry the love of Jesus Christ. We reveal, if you like, the light and the truth, the love and the glory of Jesus Christ. Look, in Ephesians, Paul is very much on the same track. Let me read for you. And you remember he's writing these things to, uh, from jail, from, from exactly the same place. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. That's after he's had 14 verses in one breath where he can't help but contain himself about Jesus Christ, the glory of God, the praise of God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, guarantee all of that stuff. Before the creation of the world, he knew you. He knew what would be in your life. And then he says in verse 15, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And here's what he prays for. He doesn't just tell you he's praying, because we do that to each other all the time. I'm praying for you. What Paul is praying is this. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. That's the passion of Paul's life. For all the people who know Jesus Christ, that's the passion of his life. I want you to know Jesus Christ better. In Philippians, and that's part of this whole gem thing, Paul's prayer is, I want to know him. Here it's, I want you to know him better. And for Paul, there's no end to the depth with which you can know Jesus Christ. And it goes a lot further than saying, ah, oh, yes, my sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. I'm never going to downplay that. But Paul simply says, the further you are engaged in this relationship and understanding of Scripture and Spirit and Revelation, the more you begin to comprehend the marvel of what has been given. I want you, I keep asking, that the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. And then he goes on, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called, that you may know the glorious riches of the inheritance of the saints, that you may know the, the great power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead that's operating in your life. sometimes wonder when I, when I read these things how it connects with how these things connect with um, the sort of boredom we sometimes feel in worship. You know, we come to church, we sort of sit there and maybe we don't even switch in. And Paul can't help himself, he's just... It's like oozing out of him the sheer power and the joy of everything that's involved in it. Um, verse 17 in that same text, I've had verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. It's Again, Paul is praying. Chapter 3, 14. For this reason, this is Ephesians, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he continues to pray. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. He wants you to have the knowledge because he knows that as you have the knowledge, you, a, a love is revealed in us that is even greater than the knowledge that you cannot understand. And then he adds, and I love this, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul is not praying that you and I may know some facts. The world around us is essentially now illiterate about Jesus Christ. 
And they have to know facts. People have to know facts. But it never stays with facts. It comes into this relationship where, where the end result right into eternity is that we are filled to the fullness, the measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ. I find that just such an overwhelming concept. I said that Paul's doing the same things in all these letters. If I go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, you know what's coming, we, we, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Because this is when you bear fruit in every good work. This is when you grow in the knowledge of God. This is when you are strengthened with all power through his glorious might so that you may have endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share the inheritance of the saints in life. But it all starts with, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Back in Ephesians, I pray that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and understanding. In other words, none of this, none of it can, can be ours and can be had by us unless the spirit of revelation is working in our lives. And that is why Jesus, when, when he talks about, you who are evil know how to good, give good things to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Again, it's not a pious thing to do. It's not a nice holy thing to ask. When we're asking the spirit into our lives, we are with the Father to give the Spirit into our lives. When we're asking that, we're asking the Father to open up to us the fullness of what's revealed in Jesus Christ because as that is revealed, the faith is growing, the power of the heart is being inspirited and the love is more freely flowing. It has a purpose, always has a purpose. Isaiah you know, Paul, did, Paul, I suppose, you know, as I said, he knew what the Old Testament was. And he must have read Isaiah. Obviously, in other things, he clearly knows about Isaiah. But Isaiah chapter 11, in the first couple of verses, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. Jesse's part of the, the lineage all the way back to Abraham. And from his roots a branch will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is Jesus we're talking about. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on this Jesus, the coming one. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is inside. It's not that Isaiah was just <clears throat> looking and hoping. Isaiah is here in the scripture because he's pointing absolutely without variation straight to the one who's coming. Jesus operated in the power of the Spirit. We too operate in the power of the Spirit. That's where the love abounds. That's where the faith grows. That's where the revelation happens. Somewhere in Colossians here, Paul says, you know, you live in a Gentile world among whom you shine as stars in the universe. You don't look like that. I don't look like that. I don't even behave like that sometimes. But this truth of Jesus Christ in us is what is operating way out there. In Ephesians chapter 4, and these, these books are all very interconnected and it's all about knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, Paul says this, I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you, no longer, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding. 
They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. See? He's saying we have knowledge, insight and understanding through Jesus Christ. But the Gentiles who do not know Jesus Christ, the people who do not know Jesus Christ, are in the futility of their thinking, darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. And it makes a lot more sense to think about that when he says, immediately afterwards, therefore they've lost all sensitivity to the things of the Lord. They've given themselves over to sensuality, to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continuous lust for more. In other words, the behaviour that is not just destructive but is evil comes when there is no knowledge and wisdom and insight and understanding. And verse 20, he adds to that, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. You did not come to know Christ that way. I wonder, do, do, we, do we get that, that the engagement, the primary first place of engagement with the Lord God Almighty is with our minds? You don't get insights in your heart. They make their way to the heart. They go through your will, but they come through your brain, through your mind. You hear them, and the Spirit helps you process them, which is why Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, be transformed, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because it's in Jesus Christ that there is truth and as Jesus the Christ, Jesus Messiah becomes embedded in your heart and also then you're engaging through your minds. That's why I can't stand it when you go to sleep during a sermon. Right? And it's not me, it's the word engages you. You're dialoguing and it takes some work sometimes to be dialoguing with the words. And responding, and that's where the spirit is working. The renewal is happening through the, through the transformation of minds. Then you can understand what Paul says, his prayer, his heart prayer for the Philippians, the Ephesians and Colossians is that you may know him better. It's why he's so obsessed, as I said before, with the fact I want to know him. Because in him is life. In him is truth. In him is resurrection, in him is holiness, in him is fruit, in him is joy and it's hope and all the things, the riches of the inheritance of God for the saints, all the things that we will experience in absolute fullness in eternity, he is releasing in us already right now. Colossians chapter 1, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. Wonderful has got this lovely little passage. Um, where, where are we? Colossians three one to four. No, it's not there, and I've lost it. I don't know where it is. But Paul talks about Paul talks about being drawn into the life of Jesus Christ. That's his passion. That's his passion for you. It's his passion for me. That's the power of our lives. It's the joy of our lives. But above all. It's the love of our lives. So praise his name. Amen. The peace of God which, keeps, which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you. Let's pray, and I invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer when you hear the refrain, Lord, in your mercy. God brought Peter to confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. So let us bring our request to God as we pray for the church and the world. Heavenly Father, thank you for your marvellous mercy which adopted us into your true Israel by baptism and which works faith in Christ through the gospel. Send messengers to take this good news to all people and bring them to repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy. We are weak, Lord, but you are strong. Protect your church and build its faith so that we may not despair in times of trouble. But be sure that not even death and hell can overcome what you build. And so protect and strengthen all who suffer persecution for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, guide us as your church, that they may together reach out with the gospel to all people. Bring each person to know the gifts you have given them and to serve your church accordingly. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our world, Father, 
and ask that you would show mercy at this time of great distress. Please speed the recovery of those with the disease and slow the spread of the coronavirus. We thank you for the efforts of all those involved in treating, testing and caring for patients and ask your protection over them as they go about their work. Give wisdom to governments around the world as they manage this crisis. We ask for your peace when we are tempted to panic or become anxious about this disease. Help us to place our trust in you, knowing that our life is safely hidden in you and that you are the Lord of all creation. Enable us to show your love to others, sharing the hope we have in you, praying and caring for the sick and needy as best we can in the name of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Unite all the members of our families in faith and devotion to you, Lord. Thank you for the faithful families of this congregation and for their service to your church and give each a clear sense of their gifts and calling. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heal and help the sick amongst us, Lord. We think of Cinderella and ask that you would bring healing and fullness of health to her at this time. Bless Pastor Hans as he seeks to care for his wife and family as well as caring for his church family. And give us wisdom in how to best support them, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the procedure that went well for Cinderella and she is now home again. Father, we think of this time too of Denise Sanka and we just ask that you would give her the, the support she needs for this long transition back to her full health with her sight. Just give her patience and forbearance and I ask too that you would, um, I'm sure Tim is, is uh, looking after her as best he can and I'd ask that you would support him as well in this, this time of, um, of uh, illness that, that Denise is suffering. Father, we think too of, of Peter, Peter Bosch, who has given long service to the postal department and, uh, and during that time has been an ambassador of yours, Lord. Father, I just ask that he would continue in that role and be the diplomat that he is to all the people that he meets on his daily walk with you. Meet the needs of all we know who are struggling at this time and whom we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, move us to offer ourselves in service to you so that your love may be seen also through us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we take our worship, our praise and prayer from this place and into our daily lives, may our lives be sustained through the love of our Heavenly Father. May we feel the presence of our Saviour walking beside us and know the power of the Spirit in both our actions and our words.
Amén.